All right. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us for Grand Rounds. We are so excited to have our special guest uh, all the way from the West Coast today, Helena Hansen, who's an MD, PhD, psychiatrist, anthropologist, a professor of psychiatry and co-chair of research theme in translational social science and health equity, and the associate director of the Center for Social Medicine at UCLA's David Geffen School of Medicine. She's widely published. I think her third book is coming out soon. Um, and a member of the National Academy of Medicine, has so much insight to bring to us, and we are excited to have her today. Dr. Hansen, take it away. Oh, thank you so much for your generous introduction, and especially for the chance to meet with you all. Um, so thank you, Dr. Weissman. Thank you, Dr. Mitaka, for reaching out to me. Um, and I understand Dr. Perlman <laughs> for um, suggesting me. I am a recovering New Yorker. <laughs> I've been at, in, at UCLA for one year. I drove cross country in the midst of a COVID surge a year ago, um, and I really miss New York. So uh, I just wanna put that out there that it's really nice to be reconnected. I'm going to try to show slides right now. Let's see if this works. Are you seeing my screen? Yes, okay, let's try to make this full screen. Okay, terrific. I just wanna give a little background to this term structural competency and the, the growing network of people that I'm working with to uh, operationalize it. So structural competency came about almost a decade ago um, and it was under different circumstances. At the time what I and Jonathan Metzl and our growing network of colleagues were pushing back against is a very simplified notion of cultural competency that seemed inadequate to address the huge inequalities in health that those of us that were practicing in New York City or pretty much any other major city in the country or in rural areas, you know, we're, we're confronting. Um, since that time, of course, we've gone through COVID inequalities that have been putting into stark relief um, the general inadequacies of our healthcare system and the way that we practice medicine here, not to mention also the movement for Black Lives that even though it wasn't focused specifically on healthcare, certainly brought into relief differences in life expectancy and um, the violence of, of racial, structural racism in our society. And so I just wanna acknowledge that it's a different environment. I have certainly found myself Oops, let me just go back for a moment. I certainly have found myself talking with a, a wide range of people since those events about structural competency and its potential place in our national response to the inequalities that we're trying to address right now. Um, but I, I just wanna give that as a backdrop. And when I started work on this, I was actually just a few blocks up the street from where you are now. I was working at NYU in the psychiatry department. I was still, a resident. Um, this was 10 years ago. And, um, and I had been asked to come up with curriculum and structural and cultural competency and to try to address my classmates dissatisfaction with cultural competency, as well as what I was learning in my own research on uh, the way the ethnic marketing of opioids and how that has shaped the opioid epidemic and its racial dynamic. Um, you know, it just, it became necessary to step up with an, an alternative, an alternative to cultural competency. This is a slide that takes me back even further in New York City. Okay, so I, I came of age, I graduated from college at, at the peak of AIDS activism. And while I bet some of you on this call weren't even born at that time, um, it was a moment of time, if you can imagine it, that was somewhat analogous to the moment that we're in now in that there's a lot of political unrest and um, a lot of frustration around and outrage around the marginalization of people who were HIV positive and in groups that were disproportionately in communities that were disproportionately affected. My computer keeps wanting me to hop ahead. Um, I, I'd like to spend a time, a moment of time on this image and what it meant for me, because it can often seem very overwhelming to try to address structural drivers of health inequalities. It can seem somehow out of 
the reach of medical practitioners. Um, you know, we train to take care of individual patients and we don't train to change government policy or to change the structure of communities or institutions. And so it can seem really overwhelming to try to address these fundamental drivers of health inequalities at their roots. But what I saw during the peak of AIDS activism was really inspiring in that people who were directly affected by HIV at the time um, were collaborating with forward thinking health practitioners. So these were physicians, these were nurses, these were other health practitioners, um, other professionals who were really dissatisfied with the lack of response um, that our government was showing and the high level of marginalization, stigmatization of people with HIV and the communities they came from. And so they collaboratively organized and had major impact on the way that we deliver healthcare, do health research, the whole idea of having people from communities directly affected by conditions serve on decision-making bodies at the NIH, for example, that got a huge lift. Uh, that was something you did not routinely see before HIV activism. And after HIV activism, it became much more taken for granted that you would include people from communities, people who are themselves HIV positive in decision-making even about scientific priorities. And then on the community level, we saw um, much more community participation in the way that research studies, um, medical clinical trials were designed and implemented. We saw a lot of support for mutual aid, mutual education around HIV and how to protect yourself. Um, so it was a real revolution in the ways that healthcare practitioners could work collaboratively with people who are affected to um, effect change. So I like to begin with that just to say, look, this can work. You can, as a clinical practitioner, have a major role in how policies, institutions, community conditions are responding to health problems. And then I just wanna also highlight, this is not a new idea. <laughs> this is an idea that goes back a, a long way. Um, and so Rudolf Virko, who is widely acknowledged as the father of Western pathology, and also by many, one of the fathers of uh, Western social medicine, who's working in then Prussia, now Germany, and who was tracking, for example, the typhus epidemic there to the living conditions of the working classes. Um, you know, he recognized that policies, institutions, social condition, community conditions have a lot to do with healthcare. And then if we come even a little closer to the present, there was an outcropping of social medicine approaches in the 60s, which somehow, you know, I've, I've been watching documentaries of health care health reform movements in the 1960s. Uh, last Friday, I saw a documentary uh, that I highly recommend called Power to Heal about how Medicare legislation was passed in the mid 60s. And I realized, you know, it feels like we're in a similar moment in time now. You know, it's, it's both a kind of a dangerous moment. There's escalating violence and factionalism in our country. And, and really the inequalities are in sharp relief. But there's also a window of opportunity for, uh, for interested people, uh, well-meaning people to get together and affect change. So I, I think the 60s was a similar moment in time to now. What I'm showing you now is a book that goes along with a 20-minute documentary on YouTube by the same title, Out in the Rural. It's about the foundation of the first federally qualified health center, FQHC. I'm in a bet that many of you have practiced in an FQHC. These are the community health centers that get federal funding to serve underserved communities. Um, this one was in the Mississippi Delta, a rural area, primarily African-American displaced, very low income people who'd been displaced from cotton fields uh, by machines. And they were literally starving. So H. Jack Geiger and colleagues um, working in the Mississippi Delta founded the first FQHC, community health center there. They made headlines by prescribing food for malnourished children to be filled at a community health center run pantry, food pantry. And the message was that the prescription for starvation is food. <laughs> it's not necessarily medicines and that doctors should be involved in that. Um, the untold story is that this community health center also bought land with their federal healthcare dollars and created a cooperative farm for these displaced 
um, agricultural workers to raise their own food and feed themselves. It also used the community health center building at night for a night school in a community where most people hadn't finished high school and um, got them GEDs, sent some people on to higher education. Many of them actually got credentialed in healthcare and came back and served the community. So it's a real structural medical story of how you can address root causes. And then we have all of the activism in the late 60s and to 70s that actually much of it around racial inequalities was centered on health. So the untold story of the Black Panther Party is that one of their main, their principal components was their free clinic system with which a lot of physicians, not all of whom were in the Black Panther Party and many of whom were, were white or other races than black, allied health professionals worked in these free clinics. It was a central part of the Black Panther Party movement in contradiction to the, the stereotype uh, in American media of angry black men with rifles. Um, so this is my friend Alondra Nelson's book on the subject, the history of the free clinic movement. And there was an analogous movement among the Young Lords Party, which was the Latin X, largely Puerto Rican counterpart to the Black Panther Party. And it turns out healthcare, again, was at the center of their struggle for racial ethnic justice. So they took over at one point Lincoln Hospital in the South Bronx and commandeered their, um, their vans, their mobile health vans to do tuberculosis screening um, and health referrals in a community that had really inadequate health care. So I just want to remind us that this has been a recurring theme, this kind of identifying health as central to um, movements for racial equity. Now, by the late 1990s, when this report by then U.S. Surgeon General David Satcher came out, the country was in a very different place than in the 60s to 70s. Um, the, we had gone through an era of a lot of privatization. The federally health care, the federally qualified health centers that H. Jack Geiger and colleagues had founded in the Mississippi Delta had undergone a lot of um, defunding, you know, and were struggling to survive. And there was a, a real kind of individualistic political ideology in the country that people should be responsible for their own health care, in a sense. So that was the, the moment in which this report, which, so this was on mental health, but there were analogous reports on physical health, um, highlighting, spotlighting, growing, racial, ethnic inequalities in health outcomes and in access to health care. <clears throat> and so this was the report that had the sound bite, for example, that black men are four to eight times as likely as white men to be diagnosed with schizophrenia, that Native Americans and recent Chinese immigrants were likely to be at a very, very um, advanced stage of uh, psychosis, if they ever got health care, much more likely to commit suicide without receiving mental health care. So those were the kinds of things this report report this report publicized. But in the absence of an analysis of what could be causing these things, it often fell back on an individualist framework of cultural beliefs and behaviors might explain these kinds of inequalities. Um, and so there was very little discussion in medical education and medical practice of what some of the larger societal structures could be that would explain these inequalities. And so in a way, it fell back on a, a cultural determinism that somehow your beliefs and behaviors would explain differences in health outcomes in healthcare. And the idea of culture was very simplistic. It was like this, that you know, there's something like black culture that's self-contained and unchanging on one side and white culture that's self-contained and on the other side um, and unchanging. And these things don't interact with each other. Um, and so I, uh, in the early days of structural competency would use this schematic to show a very different idea of culture that I as a social scientist understand, which is that cultural beliefs and behaviors um, reflect and influence institutions. You know, so they're all they're embedded in each other and they're dynamic influence each other. So if we're going to look at things that influence health outcomes, um, we know from mapping that racial segregation, residential racial segregation, which is really very prominent in the US and has been supported by public policies for the past century, that that kind of res residential segregation in combination with 
um, residence based school funding. So the tax base for local schools comes from local taxes, right? Res um, uh, housing taxes. So those kinds of things create tremendous inequalities and are directly related to what we now see as health disparities. Also mass incarceration, and we can get into this in a little more detail in a moment, but in my world of mental health and addictions in particular, drug policies that have um, systematically led to disproportionate incarceration of Black and Latinx people um, have a great deal to do directly with health outcomes. And then there's media coverage that will frame health problems often in terms of cultures of poverty, you know, the kind of the choices that people make um, to eat too much or to drink too much or uh, without any analysis of what the structural causes are. And those in turn reinforce public policies that put responsibility on individuals as opposed to creating um, more common solutions like federally qualified health centers. And then I don't want to leave out another huge uh, influence on health inequalities, which has to do with pharmaceutical companies, biotech, the industry of healthcare. So uh, that's the area that I'm studying, and I have a book coming out on that, the, the ways that pharma ha has used ethnic marketing and ideas about race and who's susceptible to addiction to create new markets um, in ways that are harmful to everyone's health white people and non-white people. Uh, but it, there's no doubt that in our country, um, the probably if you combine pharmaceuticals, biotech, insurance, health insurance industries, we're talking about the largest single sector, economic sector in our society and uh, an area of tremendous political power. So they very much shape how we practice medicine. So that, turned, that brings me to social determinants, which is a term I'm gonna guess all of you are familiar with by now. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, when I was going through medical school, uh, this was almost three decades ago now, uh, social determinants was um, not something that was discussed in medical education. It's a concept that comes from public health. But I think over the past five to 10 years in medical education, we've made big inroads in introducing the idea of social determinants of health. So I'm gonna guess that that's more familiar to you. Um, what structural competency tries to bring into relief is something that I think academic medicine is beginning to grapple with now after a couple of years of discussion of, for example, structural racism and how that might explain the huge differences in COVID outcomes, um, how it might uh, also respond to the call for attention to Black lives and the um, lower life expectancy of Black Americans and other groups. So structure by structure, which is a concept that comes from social sciences, I'm talking about, for example, community uh, conditions and community-based organizations, health relevant sectors, such as schools, housing, law enforcement, corrections, urban planning. These are sectors that we don't think of as healthcare sectors, but they have a big influence on our patients' outcomes. And then public policies, of course. And I like to distinguish social determinants of health from structural drivers of health in order to call attention to the multiple levels at which we could be acting and attending. So <clears throat> to give a couple of examples, when it comes to housing, I think nowadays in healthcare, we're more and more familiar with the idea of screening our patients for stable housing because we know that if they have insecure housing, if they're living on the streets, that means that their um, prognosis is a lot worse and we need to think about some interventions. Um, so the idea of insecure housing as, so, as a social determinant, I think is much more widespread in medicine now. But what we don't think of often is what is it that explains the disproportionate numbers of patients with insecure housing that come from some neighborhoods as opposed to others or some groups as opposed to others. For that, we have to start looking at policies um, and institutions. So in New York City, for example, we've, had, we've gone through not only decades of policies of urban renewal that have displaced residents from low income neighborhoods in order to develop the land, um, but we've also uh, been through what some, some of you may not have heard of, a policy of planned shrinkage. So you may have heard that, for example, in the South Bronx, 
in the 70s to 80s, 40% of the housing burned down. You may not know that that was directly related to a city policy that was endorsed by developers who wanted to clear land there to close fire stations in those neighborhoods with the knowledge that that would lead to um, an increase in fires that would destroy the housing stock. And so that led to a lot of housing instability. It also led to um, a lot of increase in disease and physical and mental health problems, including HIV, which got a big boost in spreading as a result of that displacement. Um, crack cocaine trade related to the, the mental health impact of that kind of displacement in poor communities, people rely on their neighbors. If you have two jobs and you rely on your neighbors to take care of your children after school, if you're forced to move to another neighborhood where you don't know anyone, it has tremendous impact. So just, just as an example, I think the second example, so that, that's a structural driver. So planned shrinkage was a structural driver. The 2008 housing crisis, directly related to predatory loans in poor and in black and brown neighborhoods. That's a structural driver of insecure housing. And then legal structures. So we are used to, I now, I think by now screening our patients for legal involvement. And what we have been talking about for the past couple of years is um, disproportionate law enforcement arrest and sentencing in poor and in black and brown neighborhoods that is, is related to mass incarceration that I was talking about before. And that has tremendous health implications. So for that, for the, the structural driver, we would look to drug policies and other policies that um, are crafted in a way that target particular communities and neighborhoods. It's often easiest to see structural drivers by looking at population compar comparative studies. This is one that came out in 2014 by the then Institute of Medicine, now National Academy of Medicine. And the sound bite from this one, you may have heard it, is that the US spends the most per capita on healthcare of any country in the world. And it actually has the worst health outcomes in most measures of any of its industrialized peer countries. And to explain that, they actually looked at systems and structural level drivers. So they looked, of course, at our lack of universal healthcare. So among our peer countries, we're really the, we stand out as a country that does not account for, you know, a large percentage of its population for health coverage. Um, also looked at policies such as those that um, don't guarantee public transportation or safe spaces and urban areas, safe walk walkable green spaces, uh, lack of public health policies such as gun laws. Um, so there are many systemic drivers of the, the poor health outcomes that we have in this country despite our spent expenditures. Here is a graph from a, um, a similar international comparative study. There was a book by these social, epidemiolo social epidemiologists, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett called The Spirit Level, in which they tracked physical and mental health outcomes in relation to social inequalities in countries, country by country. And what they found was that those countries with the largest social inequalities, largely measured as distribution of income throughout the society, had the worst health outcomes overall. So the US stood out both in mental and physical health outcomes as having the largest social inequalities of its 17 peer countries um, and also the worst health outcomes. And if you look on the bottom left hand side, countries like Japan and Germany that have less um, social inequality have better health outcomes, both mental and physical health measures. So there was a, a pretty linear relationship between the two. And the, the, the really interesting part of this study related to the spirit level is that if you look at the wealthiest people in these peer countries, these comparative countries, the countries, the wealthiest quartile, the richest people in those countries with the largest measures of inequality actually had lower life expectancy than the richest people, the wealthiest quartile in countries with better distribution of, of income and resources. So the soundbite is that inequalities are bad for the health even of the rich. And if we have time at the end of this, um, of this talk, I'd like to hear your theories about how that could be, because that's a very interesting finding. All right, and then racism. 
and including structural racism, I think has been a topic of a lot of conversation in academic medicine this past couple of years. Um, and it, uh, racism oper operates on many different levels that are relevant to health. One is the question of how does racism get under the skin, so to speak. Uh, and I have colleagues in anthropology in my social science field who do very interesting work on um, how it is that exposure to racism in society influences health. So for example, when I was in medical school, I was taught that Black Americans have very high rates of hypertension and as a result, kidney disease and end organ damage. And that this, you know, it wasn't really explained, but it was left up to us to imagine that there might be an African gene, some kind of genetic factor. When my colleagues who've actually done comparisons of skin color and hypertension in West Africa versus the US, in parts of Latin America versus the US, they found that actually that relationship doesn't hold in these other places where admittedly there is racism, but it has a very different everyday kind of um, implication, implication for everyday life than in the US. Um, and in fact, I have a colleague who studies skin tone, objectively measured skin tone in Puerto Rico and found that those who believe their skin tone to be darker have higher rates of hypertension. It doesn't correlate with their objectively measured skin tone, but if they perceive themselves to be dark skinned in Puerto Rico, which is a, a colorist kind of society, uh, they have much higher rates of hypertension. Very interesting finding. Um, and then there's institutional or structural racism. I use those terms interchangeably, but we've had a lot of conversation this past year about that, about law enforcement and the kinds of criminal legal practices that lead to disproportionate incarceration, the impact on, on the health of people who are incarcerated and also on their sending communities, residential segregation across the country, the impact that that has on health. And there are uh, people like Nancy Krieger and colleagues who, who have comprehensive theories. She has eco-social theory about how these elements work together on many different levels to explain um, the patterns of health inequalities that we see today. And here is a map uh, highlighting redlining, which I bet you have had many more conversations about this past couple of years, perhaps than before. But the idea that residential segregation has gone, goes back a long way, enforced not only by public policy, but by mortgage and small business lending practices with the red areas. This is, this is Philadelphia, for example, but you could find similar maps of New York or Los Angeles or any major city. So um, mortgage and small business lenders um, ranking those, those neighborhoods with high percentages of immigrants or black Americans as off limits for lending, um, high risk for lending versus predominantly white neighborhoods as better risks and the impact over many generations of this kind of access to home, home ownership and small business ownership. Um, showing up in health statistics. So in the US, our homes are where we store our wealth. It's uh, our, our home equity is what allows us to weather the storms of unemployment, illness in the family, allows us to send members to college. And if you don't have access to that, your, your, your stability is very tenuous, your economic stability, and therefore your health outcomes. So what we see is if you go to those areas that are redlined now, you'll see that chronic conditions, both, phys both, phys both physical and mental health conditions are chronic, are concentrated and premature death are concentrated in those neighborhoods that over the decades have not had access to those kinds of, those kinds of loans. So this is, um, this is a pitch that I don't have to make as strongly these days to my colleagues in medicine about why should we care about structural drivers of health. But I think it's worth reminding ourselves that it's not only critical for our patients' well-being, but it's also critical to our well-being as healthcare practitioners, physicians, in that surveys that are done these days of doctors who are in practice have shown, this was actually pre-COVID, right? It would be worse now, post-COVID. They're showing that physicians recognize that structural social drivers of their patient's health are critically important to their outcomes, but they feel helpless to act on them. Um, they're, are, they're reporting record levels of burnout and dropout from clinical practice, and they attribute that to the, structure, to the institutional constraints on them improving their patient's health. And um, 
we know that this has gotten even worse under COVID, but the idea is if you don't have the tools to address a critical problem like this and you go into a profession expecting to improve healthcare, you're going to be incredibly frustrated and not have satisfaction in your work. So providing tools to address those kinds of drivers of health um, should have the opposite effect, should enable us to feel empowered to act. And in fact, I have colleagues at UCSF who've been studying the impact of training clinicians to address, in their case, they're using the term social determinants of health. And they're showing that that actually improves the levels of burnout and that improves satisfaction in work. So it's for our own benefit, actually, that we should be attending to this. What can we do? And we're moving into an era where we're going to be revisiting health reform. We're going to be revisiting ideas introduced by the Affordable Care Act, such as pay per, for, pay per performance, pay for performance, so that population level health outcomes among our patients will determine our reimbursements. And so there are some ways to incentivize us to pay attention to these kinds of social and structural drivers. And then of course, our medical students and residents like yourselves have been way out ahead of us as faculty in demanding that we attend to structural drivers of inequalities, movements like White Coats for Black Lives and sanctuary clinics that students and residents formed for undocumented immigrants over the past five years. So now I enter with structural competency. It, it's a term, it's not necessarily a new set of ideas. It's a, it's a term that's repackaging old ideas. So first, the idea of structure. You know, we're in the era of, well, actually, I'll get to competency in a moment, but structure indicates the need to shift our focus, not from exclusively the level of individual patients to the institutional community level, policy level drivers of patient outcomes. And then second, there's competency. So we're in the era of competency. The AAMC and the ACGME keep multiplying the number of competencies that you all have to demonstrate before you can get credentials, right? Um, and so we're building on that ethos of competencies to flag that we need to not only understand where inequalities in health come from, but have some tools to help address them. And of course, we're not the only ones to address them. We often are important collaborators with community organizers or policymakers, people who can act at the structural level, uh, but we need tools and we need to act. And so here um, in brief are the competencies. It's uh, the way that I and Jonathan Metzl kind of charted it out. Um, in the beginning of this one, we need to recognize that structures shape, how structures shape our clinical interactions and the way that our patients present. And we need to rearticulate often the ways that patients present in terms of structural drivers of health. Uh, you know, what are the conditions they're living in? What are the institutions that are um, marginalizing them? Um, and then third, we need to observe and practice interventions on those structural drivers. And that's where I'm spending a lot of time these days, working with colleagues to create those training opportunities because we in medicine, we see one, do one, teach one, right? We're very action oriented. And so we need to know what to do. And so it, most academic medical centers don't have a lot of opportunities for this because they are founded on, a, on an individual patient practice model. Um, and so what we're, what many of us are doing across the country now is creating, often it's community-based practices where we can model another way of practicing. And I'll give some examples in a moment. Lastly, I want to highlight structural humility, which is a term that we borrowed from Jan Mar Marie Garcia and Melanie Turvalon, who in 97, I believe, published Cultural Humility, a paper on cultural humility. <laughs> Uh, where they called attention to power inequalities between physicians and patients, practitioners and patients, and how that um, shapes the interaction and, and outcomes. So we built on that to highlight that we're, with the term competency, we're not implying that doctors are all knowing and all doing, that we can do everything on our, on our own. We can somehow quickly study up on structural drivers and create massive changes in public policy and in the institutions that our patients encounter. The idea is much more that we should be working in collaboration with people who have expertise, forms of expertise that we don't. And I mentioned community organizers. I mentioned policy makers, policy advocates. 
Um, and so it's not so much that we have to master all of these things ourselves, is that we have to have the orientation to look for collaborators who have expertise that's complementary, complementary to ours. And as health practitioners, as physicians, we do have a certain symbolic capital that we can bring to bear on this. You know, when we speak as physicians, people, and we speak on something as a health issue, you know, if we identify that housing as a health issue, we get a certain ear among policymakers that perhaps lay people don't. And so we have something to contribute in collaboration. And it takes time, it takes patience. This kind of change often takes not days, weeks, or even months, it can take years. This is just a book that I'm happy to make available to you uh, that has cases of structural competency in action in different places across the country, most of them uh, academic medical centers. Um, and I'm just gonna quickly walk you through a rubric that I use around different levels of structure at which we as physicians and health, pra health practitioners can be intervening. So the first level is the low hanging fruit of what can we do right there in the clinic where we're already spending our days and nights. Um, so for example, many places across the country, there's an effort to integrate social needs into electronic medical records. And I said, I'm gonna bet that Beth Israel has been doing this as well, am I correct? So questions about food security, housing security, legal involvement, you would be prompted as a practitioner to ask those questions of your patients just by using the EMR assessment forms. Is that happening at Beth Israel? Yeah, okay, so that's one level. And actually the research that's been done on the impact of this has shown that it's led to an uptick in referrals for social services, which is what we like to see. Then there's medical legal partnerships. Does Beth Israel have a medical legal partnership at this point? And I can describe what I mean by that. Medical legal partnerships are increasingly popular at academic medical centers. It's where clinical practitioners, including physicians, um, can work with pro bono lawyers or law students to address some patient cases using legal means where it's appropriate. So for example, if you have a patient who is about to get um, evicted from their housing uh, because they're in my world of psychiatry, maybe they're symptomatic from a, a psychotic disorder, and that's in violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act, you can bring in a lawyer to help address that. Uh, for example, if you're a pediatrician and you see children are coming in with lead poisoning due to a negligent landlord who's not doing lead cleanup, you can address that with legal means. Sometimes if you see a pattern evolving, you can actually address local or even state or federal policies through medical legal partnerships. And then there's social prescribing. Remember I, I described H. Jack Geiger back in the 60s and the Mississippi Delta and the prescriptions for food at the food pantry stocked by the, um, the FQHC, by the Community Health Center. That was early social prescribing. And these days we have other forms of social prescribing. Some of you may have as pre-med students volunteered for health leads and you may have taken a prescription written by a physician or health practitioner for a patient to, for example, get assistance applying for disabilities um, coverage, right? Disabilities benefits. So, and so that you would help that person walk through the process of applying for um, disability benefits. And then there's peer navigation and use of community health workers. That's increasingly popular too. So uh, in my world of psychiatry, the idea of hiring somebody with lived experience of a serious mental illness to train and then work as a part of the, of the clinical care team. And in, in internal medicine, community health workers, and including people with lived experience of, for example, diabetes or other chronic conditions are increasingly being hired as members of healthcare teams. So those are things that you can do right there in the clinic and you're changing the structure of the health care team just by integrating people who have lived experience and who are from affected communities. Then there's the next level of community engagement and working with community organizations to partner around health problems. So I'm an addiction psychiatrist, so I have some examples from the world of addiction medicine here. And on the right-hand side in Monte Breakthrough, my good friend who just took a job up the street from you at NYU, um, Ayana Jordan, addiction psychiatrist, who has been working with Black and Latinx church leaders to place addiction medicine in churches. Why is this important? When it comes to uh, Black American 
communities. There is a lot of hesitance to go to mainstream biomedical clinics for either mental health care or addiction treatment. Many people have had very negative experiences in those places with practitioners and just systemic practices that have um, further stigmatized them, marginalized them. Sometimes they have gotten their first encounter with a psychiatrist or with an addiction medicine doctor in, in jails or prisons, you know, because as I mentioned, drug laws, racially targeted drug laws and mass incarceration resulting from that have brought many more people into the criminal legal system than into healthcare system who have addictions. So, it, so by placing addiction medicine in trusted community organizations like Black and Latinx churches, they've been able to greatly expand their outreach. They've been able to gain trust of people who avoid traditional biomedical clinics and integrate community people with lived experience into treatment teams. They've had great success with that. On the left-hand side, you see kind of an analogous movement at Native American cultural centers to integrate medicines like buprenorphine into spiritual healing centers. So that's one approach. Here's a slide just pointing to uh, an intervention that I worked on when I was at NYU. I, uh, with some residents, psychiatry residents created an outreach to Brownsville uh, in partnership with the Brownsville Partnership. It's a group of community-based organizations in Brownsville, Brooklyn, the low-income, predominantly Black uh, neighborhood of Brooklyn that has the highest density of public housing in the country and a lot of housing insecurity, um, which they found when they tried to address housing insecurity with addiction, eviction prevention, they found it was quite related to mental health problems. So people in the community weren't even able to take advantage of eviction prevention and housing assistance because of their mental health struggles. So the psychiatry residents there did a lot of creative things in partnership with these organizations, including a mental health needs assessment where they learned very interestingly that probation officers were, because this is a, a community where a lot of people are criminally legally involved, probation officers were often the first to see people with mental health problems start to um, become symptomatic. And in many cases, they couldn't get mental health intervention. So they would re-arrest their probationers just to get the mental health care, which is tragic. Um, and so the, the residents partnered with probation officers to come up with early interventions, early mental health care. Uh, they also founded some peer-led support groups throughout the community um, in, a, in an area where there's a lot of violence and premature death. And this is a spinoff from that earlier project with re psychiatry residents. So psychiatry residents at the NYU treat training site in Harlem now, a public uh, a state OMH psychiatry clinic in Harlem, go out to community-based organizations with a peer who's been trained in mental health care, a peer navigator, and they identify community resources that could be useful in patient care. So uh, they've created an interactive map where they have posted what they've learned from these site visits about community-based services and everything from soup kitchens to harm reduction centers to community art centers, um, community gardens that might be useful for, to support patient recovery and how patients can be referred to those places. And they've had great success with that. So I'm gonna to go to the next level after community organizations, the next level in my own rubric of structure is non-health sectors. How can you collaborate with non-health sectors? And I've mentioned housing, I've mentioned residential segregation in the US. And here is Mindy Fulilove. She's one of my main research mentors. She's a psychiatrist. I've known her forever. She's a psychiatrist who no longer sees individual patients. Um, she now collaborates with urban planners and architects to desegregate US cities, to, to take down highway overpasses that were deliberately placed to segregate neighborhoods by race and class and replace them with common green spaces um, and to reconfigure just, um, actually the, reconfigure the, the, the built environment 
in cities ranging from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to Orange, New Jersey as a health intervention. And how did she come to this? After decades of studying the impact of, of racial residential segregation on um, health in everything from HIV to mental health problems. And you remember the example that I gave of planned shrinkage and the burnout of 40% of the housing stock in the South Bronx and how that accelerated HIV transmission and led to a lot of trauma and mental health problems in relation to displacement from neighborhoods of origin. That's where, that's the research that she started with. So as a solution to that, she's actually treating cities as opposed to treating the pathologies of cities as opposed to individual patients. And then I get to the last, the last level of structure, which is public policy. I'm an addiction psychiatrist, so my world is drug policy, right, as a major driver of inequalities and in outcomes. And this is an organization that I believe is still active in New York that you could join if you're interested, From Punishment to Public Health. It's a collaborative organization of health practitioners, uh, public health researchers, people who've been incarcerated who are now advocates, and also disenchanted law enforcement officials. And what they've done is gotten together to figure out how practically speaking, they can divert people from incarceration to mental health care. Because a whole lot of people who are now in the criminal legal system um, actually should be getting mental health care. And that would be a more appropriate way to address the behaviors that got them into the criminal legal system. So they've done a lot of interesting things. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just, jump to two examples. One is that they've created with NYPD, they've created a way to get mental health assessments for people picked up on minor charges on the subway system. So rather than arresting them immediately, police will bring them into a mental health assessment station and get them assessed. And that's led to a large percentage of them getting mental health care interventions rather than arrest. But the interesting piece here is that they also train people like us, physicians and other healthcare practitioners, to give testimony to policymakers and to write op-eds. So that's a really important um, intervention that we can make actually is to learn how to speak to policymakers and to the public about the health impact of public policies that are being proposed, ranging from drug policies to housing policies. These things have an incredible impact on our patients' health. And so we're able to, again, bring that, that symbolic capital as physicians, as healthcare practitioners to bear. Um, and with that, I'll just leave you with this image as an invitation. So we're this is a website that we're busily updating right now. It's, if you were to visit this moment, it's a little bit out of date, but we're about to um, we're about to post educational resources that our network of colleagues working in this area have created so that we can begin to share wisdom and share material about how to prepare ourselves for a structural intervention. And you can actually register for our listserv as well on this website, structuralcompetency.org. So with that, I've left all of 10 minutes <laughs> for discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, you know, there, there's been a, an active chat, I think, mostly looking up those references that you cited and some references other people um, have had. And I'm grateful uh, for you to keep mentioning FQHCs, which I'm very proud of and proud to have worked on several of. And you may know that our residents, about a third of them rotate, do their primary care experience at an FQHC um, in the neighborhood. So that's great. That's um, fantastic. Oh, yes. And thank you, Dr. Perlman. <laughs> Spot on. <laughs> Dr. Perlman's increasing your uh, citation score. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to see if there are any questions in the chat. Meanwhile, I don't know if other people have questions. Oh, Dr. Perlman has his hand raised. Maybe while I look through the chat, I'll let him ask the first one. Thank you, Dr. Hansen, for that fantastic talk and your fantastic work. Oh, um, thank you. And um, uh, I'm glad you mentioned how to talk to policymakers. I, I, I want to ask a, a related question of, of you know, there's a tremendous emphasis in medical education, as you well know about, you know, training people in evidence-based medicine, but 
the preponderance of evidence on which people in training and the people who train them rely is also very entirely, or if not entirely, very largely individual level based. And, you know, this is everywhere, including in research mantras like, you know, from bench to practice, implying there's nothing other than bench and, you know, making a molecule and applying it to practice. So are there efforts or could you comment on the need for and efforts to enhance the structural competency of researchers so that the evidence base, no, I'm, I'm very serious. I mean, you can turn to Nancy Krieger or your work and there's work that reflects that, but so much of it doesn't. And most training and PhD programs, whether that's in epidemiology or clinical research has an entirely individual level focus. So are there efforts to fix that so that the evidence the clinicians come to rely on reflects structurally competent thinking? That is so beautifully put. And I would love to quote you <laughs> going forward. That's so beautifully put. Um, in fact, I, that is kind of where our structural competency network is right now. So there's one person, one member of this network who is currently a psychiatry resident, but started with us as a medical student who is writing a piece exactly on this right now on evidence-based medicine and the, the individualist bias built in to what we in academic medicine consider to be the evidence. And so you're absolutely right. This is a critical area. So in response to that, there's another subset of our structural competency network that is currently drafting a manifesto around the need for social science within academic medicine, because that's an area of research that's largely unaddressed, you know, not really included in academic medicine. Um, there are some psychologists in academic medical centers, the ones that are the best funded by NIH and the most kind of active tend to be individual focused psychologists who are doing, you know, FRMR, fMRI scans of um, individuals in response to different cues, as opposed to looking at the community level, institutional level, policy level drivers of health that I've been talking about. And so I'm jointly trained in social science, you know, in anthropology. And it turns out there's a growing number of physicians and other healthcare practitioners that are cross-training in social sciences. There are some social scientists who've actually managed, who do look at community and, and institutional and policy drivers that have managed to get a presence in academic medicine. And so a group of us have come together to write a manifesto about the need for this, the critical need for um, real rigorous attention to the social using methods and concepts from the social sciences that are largely foreign to med academic medicine. And um, we're also putting together grant proposals and funding that would support more joint training, that would support more curriculum development using the social sciences, because I think you're spot on. The evidence right now is this idea of a gold standard of a randomized control trial, something that you can test in a randomized control trial. We've just been talking about housing, about you know a whole lot of factors that don't lend themselves to rent. Some housing programs actually could be tested and have been tested in randomized control trials. And who has taken the lead in that? Largely people who've had some training in social science. Um, but not all of these, these um, dynamics can be captured in that kind of very reductionist model of a medication. You know, we need to understand how in unstable housing impacts health in a much more dynamic ecological way along the way, along the lines of Nancy Krieger and colleagues. So I think you're, I'm totally in support of what you're implying here, which is that we, we have to have robust evidence that looks at social and structural drivers. Absolutely. And I see, is this Dr. Risk? I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, Dahlia, please. Um, first of all, I just loved every aspect of your lecture. I'm so appreciative, um, so insightful. And and not enough of this is talked about. I mean, it's like all music to my MPH ears. It's stuff that we um, did um, that I went back for my MPH for. And that to me is just like 
bread and butter of like what we should be doing in everyday conversations apply to every aspect of what we do. So for example, some of the lectures that you talked about in part of your lecture about, you know, pay for performance and how, you know, looking at this, we've been looking at readmission penalties and how they do, are disparately like penalizing safety net hospitals or hospitals that are um, trying to do the best for the most underserved communities and will always be behind. So how do we readjust those metrics and say, don't penalize the safety net hospitals, give more support so we can create more infrastructure. Or, or all of the things that you talked about, you know, with built cities and, and communities and all of the structural things are just, to me, it's just so important that we're talking about this in everyday practice and it seems so disconnected from how we're like learning medicine. So similar to what Dr. Perlin is saying, it just seems like it has to be so much more foundational to how we're doing education and training for from the beginning until now, all of the things that are causing the most disease and all of how you know, we're, <laughs> I thought that like upper echelon disparities um, amongst countries is very interesting. We could probably speculate all the different reasons, but um, I just think it's so important for us to create like foundational education around all of the elements that you talked about throughout all of our training at every level. And it just seems like just a different kind of parallel conversation among people that are interested, but not really applying to our daily work. I couldn't agree with you more, but there's got to be a way to mainstream this. <laughs> and there, the, the countries that are doing better than us in terms of outcomes, they have done that. They've incorporated social medicine into the fabric of training and practice um, in ways that we don't even come close to doing. And of course, there, there are very concrete structural reasons that we teach and practice medicine this way. We, you know, there are industries and shareholders that have a lot more to do with the way that we practice medicine now than health, public health principles or anything that we're trained in, even on an individual level. You know, I think a lot of the burnout and frustration of practitioners now is that they are the ones bearing the brunt of the illogic of our, our rubrics, which come from health insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies. They come from share, the interests of shareholders. They don't come from good healthcare practice, right? So we're, we're up, we're butting up against a big contradiction. Yeah. And so I, I totally agree with you. I wonder if you or your colleagues in the residents have some thoughts about how we can do more of bringing this into the center of medicine. How I can do. we- I do, I'm gonna email you. <laughs> For sure, I would email you. And one other comment you made, um, and I think it is really important, we don't really learn advocacy and public policy. And there are outlets and ways, for example, I'm on the public policy committee for our national society. We go to Washington. I brought Dr. Hoy and some of my colleagues down to Washington and advocated for certain things pertaining to hospitalists, but ACP, AAMC, there are other ways that you can get involved and start to help like create the, the conversation to, and educate people that need help to try to change things that are very important to us as physicians, as healthcare institutions, um, et cetera. That's a really good point. Our professional societies actually have, sometimes they have the flexibility to go out ahead on these issues. I don't think the AMA has taken a whole lot of leadership, but I think some of our specialty organizations have taken more. And so maybe we can move our professional societies in this direction. Um, Dr. Glasper. Yeah. Oh, okay. Last, oh, was there someone uh, else? <laughs> one, well, one o'clock. I wanted to let everybody go back to work, but Justin, I'll let you uh, have the last quick question. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe this will get to some of the, the specifics of, of what Dr. Risk is getting at. Um, I'm wondering if you can comment at all on like, you know, in, in incorporating things into education, I guess one of the things that I've seen is that like, you know, Suboxone is an incredible treatment for addiction that I think a lot of folks just aren't getting enough training on. And I'm wondering if you can speak to maybe some of the barriers that you've seen and, and how best to overcome that in getting our, our residents and, and medical students comfortable using this. Thank you for that question. It's very close to my own heart. And that's actually the subject of my book <laughs> in that I'm trying to do a very deep dive with the book in analyzing the structural explanation for the demographics of the opioid crisis, number one, and also our national response to it. And there are very concrete reasons why Suboxone is 
pretty inaccessible to publicly insured patients. It was by design, you know, it was a deal cut between the manufacturer and regulators and Congress that this would be a separate treatment track available to a wider and more affluent clientele coming out of the opioid crisis. Because of all of the fear of public resistance to prescribing opioids in black and brown communities, you know, because black and brown people have been associated with addiction, diversion, misuse for many decades. And so there's an explicit deal cut that this would be a, um, a response to the white suburban opioid crisis, if you will, people who are quote unquote, not appropriate for methadone. This is actually written into the congressional record. You can actually see the Congress people talking in coded language about the suburban opioid problem being so different than the, the rural, I mean, the urban opioid problem. Um, and so what we're now up against is in making treatments like buprenorphine more widely available is the structural racism of drug policy and pharma policy. So we have to address it at those levels. Thanks. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you. I'd love to keep in touch with you all. The pleasure was ours and we will certainly keep in touch. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a us. good day. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. You too.